Hi friends, this is going to be one of those videos that I call potpourri. It's a bunch of unrelated random clips that I'm just cleaning out my memory cards. Enjoy. Thanks for watching. Please enjoy my stories or whatever else might be on my mind today. Hey, I found another question I thought it would be fun to answer. Uh, Missy Pop 5434 wants to know what is the most unusual meat you have ever eaten in Mexico or elsewhere? Uh, the most unusual thing I've ever had in my mouth was smoked snake, uh, smoked cobra. Years ago, I was, was uh, working on a sales crew, door to door sales, and a lady asked me if I wanted to try some smoked cobra. Uh, she was Indian, not uh, Native American Indian, uh, India Indian, you know, with the dot on her forehead. And uh, I tried it, and it was horrible. It was more than horrible. It was 50 years ago, and I still get that blah, 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 taste in my mouth when I think about it. It was bad. If you ever get the chance to try smoked cobra, pass. Uh, what else? Oh, armadillo, 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 armadillo. English, Spanish, having trouble with my, never mind. Armadillo. Tried that at one of those parties where you got to eat strange things and it was uh, not bad. It was barbecued, armadillo. What else? Oh, dogfish. There's a story. A dogfish is a kind of shark. Um, and uh, we were fishing in a... Uh, eight foot dinghy, a uh, Livingston dinghy up in uh, Canada, in the Georgia Strait. Anyway, uh, I and a guy named Merv, we, we hooked a few of these shark, and one of them, we got it up to the top of the water. We're fishing, we're in an eight foot boat, two of us. We're fishing in the bay, in the ocean water. And we got one up and the mouth was about this big around and we just cut the line. We're not dealing with that. But another one we got and we've decided that we we're going to try to eat one of these things. So we, we got a, we got a, a shark in the boat. Now it's an eight foot boat and this shark was about four feet long. So, and there's one of us in each end of the boat. So there's, yeah. And we, I'm sorry dispatch it, which is what you do when you're fishing. Anyway, um, the rest of this story is probably should not be told, but I'll tell it. Uh, on the way back across the bay to our motherships, um, it had live birth of four babies, which we released into the water. But the mother was already, as I said, dispatched. You use a bat, it's about this long, and it's like a little baseball bat. Anyway, um, we took a couple of fillets off of it. One big fillet off of each side, you know, it's like maybe this long and this wide and this thick. And uh, this is way before you could Google what to do with it and get a recipe. So we soaked it in salt water overnight. And then the next morning we'd gone about 20 miles up to a place called Princess Louisa Inlet. And Princess Louisa Inlet is a, another small bay and you're right up against the mountains. And the joke is always, well, how, uh, what's the elevation here? Because you can reach out of your boat and touch the mountain, even though it's really deep. There's a mountain right there. It goes way up and there's a dock anyway we're uh barbecuing this dogfish filet and it's starting to smell bad now it's not true but we, we claim that it cleared out the whole everybody in the in the bay left they didn't leave but we wound up just dumping the barbecue over the side of the dock into the water never never tasted it uh but the smell that was enough to say, yes, I've tasted it. Dogfish, don't eat a dogfish. I got a lot of dogfish stories. My son one time up in Puget Sound, 
he was probably about, I don't know, eight years old, and he's fishing off the side of the boat. And he got a, a dogfish hook. There wasn't, uh, I didn't see it, but we were catching them. They were like this big, not big. And he got it up in the top and he said, he yelled shark and he threw his pole in the water. <laughs> uh, let me know if you want to hear some more stories about dogfish and, sh and fishing uh, out of the boat up in Canadian waters. I have some friends and I'm in their house, not telling you where it is or who it is, uh -huh. but he built this bridge for the cats. Uh -huh. Oh, well, the cat's not going to participate, but look at this. The bridge goes from here, uh -huh. the cat goes up this pole, uh -huh. over here, uh -huh. all the way, keeps going, keeps going, keeps going. And what does he do when he gets over here? Turns around. Turns around. <laughs> Is that amazing? <laughs> Talk about a, a cat tree. No, it's a cat bridge. It's a cat tree. I love this comment. Jimmy Franny, your manner of speaking is reminiscent of the legendary actor Jack Palance. Loved it. Uh, I was a great fan of Jack Palance, and I remember uh, on Johnny Carson's Tonight Show, he read Edgar Allan Poe's um, The Raven. Ah, uh, distinctly I remember, it was the bleak December. And every dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Suddenly, there came a tapping, as if someone gently rapping, rapping on my chamber door. I'm sure that's not exactly the words. Maybe I'll look it up and do a paragraph. <laughs> uh, distinctly, I remember it was the bleak December and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow, for vainly I sought to borrow from my books surcease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore, for the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, nameless here forevermore. That's not my favorite Edgar Allan Poe. My favorite is Annabel Lee. No one will ever dissever my soul from the soul of the beautiful Annabel Lee. Maybe I'll try that whole poem another time. Again! <laughs> oh, good job. Did you? Wait a minute, that was pretty exciting. Did you remember to make a wish? No, and all that. No, I didn't. <laughs> it's not too Do late. Do I get a second chance? Yeah. <laughs> Woo. That's where I am today, sticking my face into the Eagle 30 at 360 degree dental imaging device. Hi, friends. I'm getting the initial procedure for one implant today. And my mouth is starting to not work over here on this side, so... I'll check in with you later and let you know how this goes. 30 minutes, all done, no pain. So now we wait six months. Uh, hopefully, this side of my mouth works a little better in less than that. Well, so now that's my that's the threaded thing that something gets screwed into later. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, actually, we, uh, you know, this is a screw, and in the middle has another estrel. Mm -hmm. so that's how we attach the crown to the to the implant properly. Okay. So now we need to wait. Uh, I recommend six months to be completely sure because we are bone, mm -hmm. and the the thing is, yeah. the root is not completely. Uh, circle, right. you know, so did usually it's elliptical. Did you say you added bone? <laughs> yes, because the socket is was probably something like this. Mm -hmm. So we place the implant in the very center, yeah, mm -hmm. and we have bone 
around the, the implant to seal yeah. that and improve the quality of the bone in the future. Mm -hmm. So now it's the, the thing we need to wait for six months to be completely sure and later we could build a new crown. But let me tell you something, everything was perfect. I mean, <laughs> you have a uh, pretty good bone, mm -hmm. that's good. So now it's, it's just, uh, let's wait for this time. Okay. I will give you the tears after surgery and the prescription. Okay. This included a full dental laser topography, extraction of a tooth broken off at the gum line, and a bone graft. Well, this segment is going to be what's on my mind today. I snapped this picture at Walmart the other day because it just um, amazed me that the price of eggs was whatever this is, like a couple of bucks a dozen U.S. dollars. And uh, I was paying somewhere between five and six dollars a couple of months ago for a dozen eggs in southern Arizona. And that's all I was going to point out is that the price of eggs here is two dollars and the price of eggs up there was between four and five dollars or between five and six at one point. Anyway, I decided to um, just Google what the current price of eggs was in the United States just out of curiosity and I went down into the black hole of time, the Google rabbit hole, and I found out more about the price of eggs than probably anybody higher on the food chain than a chicken needs to know, but here's what's on my mind today. <clears throat> First of all, I read this, that uh, the price of eggs in Manhattan rose to between 13 and 18 dollars at some specialty markets. 18 dollars for a dozen eggs, wow. Of course, the uh, Egg Council blamed it on the, a the, the um, avian flu, which all got ended a long time ago. The maximum price of commodity, um, egg commodities, was December 18th, 2022, and by January had, had dropped 52%. It's currently, uh, the commodity price of eggs is about 81 cents a dozen. That's the commodity price of eggs. Anyway, um, I then read this, where it said, uh, where is it? Some Americans got creative with their sourcing. So you're gonna see why this attracted me and I found it humorous in the beginning. Attempts to smuggle eggs across the US-Mexican border have surged according to US Border Patrol. With the agency reporting that the number of egg and poultry seizures rose 108% from October to December, 2022. And like I said, at first I found that humorous, and then I got to thinking about what that really represents to me as a bigger picture. First of all, I'm paying taxes for the U.S. Border Patrol to do the important job of seizing eggs as they come across the border. I didn't know it was illegal to bring eggs across the border. And I've been across the border a few times. No, no What? Yeah, no pork. No, you can't bring pork, but that's another story. Um, <clears throat> why am I paying U.S. tax dollars to get eggs stopped on their way across the border from Mexico to the United States? Anyway, what thought it brings to mind is that how happy I am sometimes to be living in Mexico where there are fewer rules and more freedoms. The United States of America is no longer the land of the free. Anyway, um, yeah, smuggling eggs across the border because of the price. Uh, unfortunately, when I was in Southern Arizona, um, I uh, didn't think of that. <laughs> I might have. <laughs> 
Anyway, uh, that's my random thought for what's on my mind today. Oh, Lynn yelled out, you can't take pork. Um, years ago, we were going north and I had a pork roast in the freezer of my motorhome. And uh, we stopped at a restaurant for dinner and uh, we knew that we had this pork roast. And so at first I offered him the pork roast um, to cook, and, uh, but it was frozen. So anyway, we made a deal that I could uh, park overnight in their parking lot uh, with my motorhome uh, in return for the pork roast. And we paid for our wonderful dinner that we had uh, years ago. Can't take pork. Friend of ours came back from Japan and um, had purchased some very expensive curry. And curry, as you know, is not a thing, it's a recipe. There's different kinds of curries and different blends of spices to get different curries. Well, this particular curry was mixed for beef, to season beef. So on the label it said curry for beef. And U.S. Customs in Seattle, at the airport in Seattle, took away her, and I, and I forget exactly how much it was, but it was like $100 or more for this little bottle of curry. And they would not let it come in because it said beef on the label, curry for beef. It wasn't beef, it was a combination of spices to season beef. Hey. Hey, if you like me, give me one of those thumbs up. And please subscribe and hit that little bell so you know when I post next. Please share me with your friends on social media. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed what was on my mind today.